Hello, Professor Bonin, can you hear me? Um, uh, would you like to share your screen uh, for the presentation? Sure. <clears throat> Hmm. Great, I can see your slides. Professor, thank you very much for your time. I know it's very early in your part of the world. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, I'm saying thank you very much for your time. I know it's very early uh, at your site. No, this is a, actually it's a nine o'clock. It's not that early, so. Okay, all right. All right. So the half of the day is gone. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> right. <laughs> <coughs> So we'll just wait for a few more, a uh, few more minutes, maybe three to four minutes, so that uh, we can have more people joining us. No Join us. Sure. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good, uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Hazima Mozam and I welcome you all uh, to an exciting webinar organized by Comstech. Um, we are very delighted and honored to have our esteemed speaker with us. Um, he is Professor Dr. Bolent Aydegan. Uh, professor Dr. Bolent is a professor of radiation and cellul cellular oncology. He is a director of medical physics and director of small animal radiation research uh, at University of Chicago. Uh, the title of his talk today is Personalized Medicine in, uh, in uh, RT, that is radiation therapy, um, the hope or a hype. Uh, just to uh, introduce him briefly, uh, Professor Eidegen, uh, he holds, the, as I told you earlier, holds the position of Director of Medical Physics and is responsible for overseeing a dynamic team of six academic professionals and 40 clinical experts. He, he has a, compre a comprehensive foundation in medical physics enriched by specialized training and proficiency in various domains such as research, education, leadership, clinical excellence, particularly in the realm of radiotherapy. He, he is also the inaugural director of Small Animal Re Radiation Program and Center for Cl Clinical Oximetry at University of Chicago. His primary areas of expertise and passion lie within translational clinical radiation oncology spanning vital facets such as image-guided therapy, diagnostics, <laughs> diagnostic <laughs> both anatomical and functional imaging model, uh, modalities for gauging therapy response and individualized medical approaches. Notably, he has garnered international recognition as an authority on LENIAC-based TMI technique, a breakthrough he conceptualized and successfully integrated into the clinical practice. His notable accomplishments include seven phase one and phase two clinical studies focused on acute myeloid leukemia and multiple melanoma, showcasing the clinical viability and tangible benefits of his approach. His com commitment extends to the com global community where he has been contrib contributing to the dissemination of this groundbreaking technology by providing training and guidance to the esteemed institutions worldwide. His active engagement in the realm of nanotechnology 
has led to the development of innovative uh, platforms with agnostic accomplishments applications. This is exemplified by his pioneering work involving a targeted nano gold contrast agent for both uh, CA diagnostic diagnosis and therapy, a milestone that culminated in the award of a full patent in 2016. Most recently, a collaborative endeavor in the con in, in conjunction with Northwestern and Case Western, Case Western um, has yielded a significant achievement at NIH um, R, R01 grant. This aims to improve prostate cancer therapy through high-tech precision and targeting tumors using PSMA and GDMRI. This undertaking is vital to facilitate advanced image-guided preclinical radiation therapy capabilities required to improve cancer outcomes. Uh, we, Professor Bolin, on behalf of Comstech and myself, I'm extremely grateful for your time and um, to share your research and experience with us. Over to you, sir. Thanks so much for that kind of introduction. <clears throat> and then I apologize. I'm a um, little under the weather and then my, uh, I might be coughing here and there, but um, so please bear with me. Um, so let's go ahead and start. So um, first let me introduce our current um, projects and then what we are, what we have been doing. So currently we have um, oops, um, a uh, diagnostic uh, project. Basically, we are creating or developing a uh, diagnostic nanoparticle platform to treat the uh, prostate cancers. So that is supported by an NIH grant. And we have uh, an invest investigation of optimal adaptive treatment method for the um, radiotherapy of metastases that is supported by um, a, a, a uh, industrial grant. And we are currently uh, developing an oxygen guided HDR uh, bracket therapy technique. And then um, that is uh, supported by NIH. And we are also developing intra treatment uh, CEDAR real-time 4D comb beam CT guided personalized uh, radiotherapy, again, supported by the industry. Um, we have um, some uh, really interesting and exciting projects uh, coming up um, that we are actually in the process of um, developing and uh, trying to get a grant. So we, uh, based on our recent um, innovations, uh, trying to do oxygen-guided radiotherapy, we started our own company. Uh, the name of the company is Oxygen Cure uh, LLC and uh, currently is under the um, <clears throat> uh, startup incubator here. And we are hoping that, you know, like we, uh, what we develop uh, during, through this research, hopefully we can actually impact uh, quite, um, the uh, radiotherapy by guiding the uh, or it, uh, accomplishing uh, better outcome by guiding the radiotherapy where its need is the most where the oxygen uh, lacking regions in the uh, tumor, which is the hypoxia. So we are also looking at the synergistic effect of the histotripsy and radiation and then also immunotherapy. So the idea here is combining um, the old arsenals that we have to treat cancers in the most meaningful way so that they can actually, um, you know, like they do um, their own uh, effect and then uh, uh, in, a, in a more meaningful way that so that we can just uh, treat the uh, tumor so that, you know, like it will not recur. So we are also uh, building an EPR flash IGRT uh, uh, machine right now so that, you know, like we can uh, better uh, see the oxygen uh, and then hypoxic regions within the tumor so that, you know, like we can actually um, target them with the flash therapy, which is a very high dose uh, radiotherapy. And then also <laughs> we are developing a multi-institutional phase two studies for the total mirror irradiation. So with this uh, overview in my lab, 
Um, I'd like to go to uh, the main topic that we are going to be talking. So my lab here at the University of Chicago deals with the personalized medicine. So we are our idea is to bring the personalized radio uh, personalized medicine into radiotherapy. So that you know, like the we took uh, we can take every individual uh, as a single individual and then uh, design a treatment based on him or her and then based on their tumor, right? So right now, you know, like we generally use one size fits all, and that is kind of, uh, it's not the, it shouldn't be the uh, the state of the art. So we have to be able to, you know, like the design a treatment for every patient. And um, be, the personalized of the treatments is around for the last uh, 2,500 years. Uh, indeed, Hippocrates use a person's height, physiques, age, and the season to personalize treatment for his patients. And then today that we will do as well, right? So, you know, like our medicine, our drugs are generally, the, you know, like the, um, you will see that, you know, like the, it's arranged a according to uh, the dose, which is, is uh, you know, arranged according to the patient's um, specific uh, 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 situations. So, however, um, you know, although, you know, like the, the personalization in medicine is known for the last uh, 2,500 years, the successful examples of that in radiotherapy is not that many. And so um, that's what we're going to be trying to um, talk today. And then what are the possible ways of that? You know, my lab is trying to make this happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we are going to talk about personalized treatment for hematological malignancies. And we are going to talk about oxygen-guided radiotherapy and teragnostic uh, nanoplatform for prostate cancers. So I think, you know, I have um, too many slides and then I'm just going to be flying some of those because, you know, like I think we have uh, almost one hour, uh, less than one hour at this point. So, um, so um, in the... Uh, so I don't know how many of you guys know radiotherapy, but you know, like the we currently use radiotherapy uh, in the uh, treatment of the uh, blood cancers, hematological cancer like leukemia. Um, however, you know, like the, it's uh, being used less and less, and then one of the reason for that, that uh, when combined with the chemotherapy, um, it was um, this. Some of the earlier studies show that. Um, basically, radiotherapy is kind of toxic, right? Um, the reason is generally the chemotherapy is very toxic already. And then adding radiation on top of that, although it has benefits, you know, like it becomes toxic. And one of the uh, clinical trials actually look at that, you know, when without changing the chemotherapy, what they did is they increased the dose uh, from six times two gray to the seven times two to two point two five gray. So you know, like they basically, they gave the patients uh, six fractions of the two gray radiation versus the seven fractions uh, of two point two five gray. As you can see, the relapse, you know, like the rate decrease by almost more than half. I mean, double. You know, like the, as you can see, the relapse is around like 40% here is like, oh, you know, maybe 15% a year, right? So it's pretty good. And again, you can see that these patients, you know, like they don't do well already, right? So, yeah. but you know, like the, uh, the remove, I mean, the reducing the relapse rate uh, to less, less than 20% is a great deal. However, this does not translate into overall outcome. As you can see, mortality, the patient dies in two years or the, in one year, right? It was doubled from, you know, like the low uh, radiation to the higher radiation group. So this def definitely, you know, like they said that, you know, radiation is toxic. So we should not be, you know, like the really, you cannot really increase the dose to these patients. If we can eliminate, we should eliminate the radiation all altogether. So um, oh, this is the conclusion, basically. They said that, you know, like we need a higher dose to, you know, treat these patients and then improve the outcome. However, you know, like the, the higher dose is almost impossible because then, you know, like the, we are not going to be able to, you know, like the, uh, keep these patients alive because of the toxicity. So, you know, like the, based on that, 
um, we decided that, you know, like we, what we need is a more targeted strategies and then developed a technique where, you know, like the total body irradiation before, before we actually developed this technique, what they used to do, they used to treat the whole body. And what we did is, you know, we decided, you know, like the, um, by talking with the doctors, <clears throat> Karwat, the um, most important cr cl uh, critical organs that causes the toxicity. So we actually reduce the dose to those organs by actually uh, targeting the main target in the blood diseases, which is the blood marrow, which is in the skeletal um, system of the body. So, <laughs> so this was a very difficult technique. And then over the last 10 years, we developed actually um, clinical techniques, how to treat these patients uh, very effectively and efficiently. And, and then throughout that way, you know, like um, throughout our journey, we publish um, quite, uh, close to 15 papers right now on the, you know, like the techniques that we are developing, you know, how we improving the efficiency and then also our outcomes. So um, currently we have, um, we have like four phase one studies and actually three of them are done and then we publish them. And then we have three phase two studies and then we have some works in progress uh, to uh, do some multi-institutional phase two studies. So this is our first study. And uh, basically we look at the tolerability and then um, feasibility and toxicity. And then we have found that, you know, like our result actually demonstrate that when actually we use targeted uh, uh, treatment, uh, we actually do not cause toxicity. That was the, you know, like really uh, the first step. And uh, then, you know, like we look at in the second trial um, to the benefits of this uh, treatment. And in that, um, we compared our result to the overall survival um, uh, throughout the time, especially, you know, like the two years here. Um, and then this is our historic data. If you can see the mean uh, survival on these patients is uh, in our group is around 20%. Um, <clears throat> with our data though, when you add the total marrow irradiation, so these patients do very well. So as you can see, you know, like we actually double the survival, more than double the survival um, on around like the uh, three years. <coughs> So um, basically our, um, the survival rate, overall survival rate was 23%. And then in our group, with adding our technique, which is a total marrow radiation, we improved the, uh, our overall survival to 50%. And then similarly, progression-free survival as well improved from 18% to 48%. So what is the pro pro uh, progression for your survival? Basically, these patients will have some symptoms of the diseases or the, the you know, like the, their tumors will come back or, in, uh, you know, like they will get larger or whatever. And then, you know, like you just time the time that, you know, like the basically that occurs. And then generally that, you know, like the, as you can see on um, around two years is around 18%. And then in our trial is uh, around 48 trial. Uh, 48%. Okay, so I am going to be in the interest of time uh, passing this. So, you know, what are, what are we trying to do right now? So um, basically, there is a new uh, pet agent, and uh, it is called FLT pet. And then FLT pet is a little different than the FDG pet. And then FD, in the FDG pet, what you do is you use the sugar uh, metabolism in the body and then the cancer takes, you know, like use more sugar as such, you know, like the fluorine 18 goes to more to the, uh, uh, the tumors. And then you just basically use the positron emission tomography to get the coincidence uh, photons so that you can detect them, right? So, you know, in this case, you know, like what we are looking at it, you know, like the, the FLT pet targets the proliferation of the cells. So you know, where the most of the proliferation happens, of course, is the cancer because the cancer divides right very fast. So you know, like it uptakes that as such. You know, like we can um, detect the where the most of the proliferation has happened. So what they find out that is an econ ecrin uh, clinical trial. This FLT pet can be um, if it is completely uh, removed. You know, like the after the chemotherapy, though there is no signal 
then these patients actually has a very high likely uh, chance to get uh, uh, cured. However, if they, after the chemotherapy, as early as two days, right, if these patients do not clear the FLT path, meaning that they still have remaining diseases, then these patients, although they finish the whole treatment, they're not going to respond to that. So this is a very early um, signal which patients are going to be responding to treatment. And then that's a very important uh, aspect of what we are doing. And then generally, we do not have that mechanism, right? So, you know, like that is actually a magic tool. So if you have a magic tool and you start the treatment as early as two days, if you know if a patient is going to respond to treatment, right, that's good. If not going to respond to treatment, what would you do? Then you change the treatment, right? So then, you know, you can intensify the treatment, but we don't have that currently. And then that is actually a key. So, you know, like the in cancer in general, there are two um, I think areas that um, that really helps overall survival of the patients. One is early detection. And the second is if we have any way to find out as early as when we start, even within the first week of the treatment, if we know that the patient responds to the treatment, then that patient's you know, like hopefully will uh, have a better survival rate. And then for those who does not respond, we have to do something better. And then in this case, this is actually lends itself very um, conveniently, uh, the FLT pet to do something like that in the uh, total mirror, in the uh, hematological or the blood cancers like a leukemia. So, you know, like what this uh, study find out, it is a clinical trial, okay? The patients, right? who actually responded the, or the FLT pet showed that responded the treatment, actually they survived better. And then as we said earlier, as early as day two, when you do a, a FLT pet and then FLT pet shows that still uh, the, uh, the disease, then, you know, like those patients don't survive, right? So, you know, like look at this 70% in this group Right, so this is a different uh, group. Maybe most likely, uh, the uh, this group is uh, is uh, earlier stage. You know, like the risk is not high risk group. The one that I showed you um, earlier. So the, in the high risk group, you know, like the, your survival is around forty percent in two years. But in this group, as you can see, this is a less risk group, um, and then the survival is around like the sixty five to seventy percent. Uh, but in the group that that does not FLT pet picks you know, like the, the survival is around 40%. So they become high risk group, right? You know, like this. So you can identify these patients as the high risk. So um, the uh, the hypothesis to test, you know, like to give patients yeah, FLT pet on the second day of the chemotherapy, and then find out those patients that, you know, who does not respond to the chemotherapy and then add total marrow irradiation therapy. And then hopefully we can make them a responders, responders to the therapy by adding targeted total marrow irradiation. So this is um, currently, you know, like what we are testing and our early results are pretty prom promising. And um, so hopefully, you know, like we'll finish and um, establish this method to help uh, the, uh, the patients, uh, in, hopefully worldwide. And the second group is a very similar idea. It's the multiple myeloma. And in the multiple myeloma group, you can actually, you know, def, uh, stratify patients into the high or low risk group by gen genetic profiling. However, again, if you use, in this case, not FDG, but F, uh, FLT, but the FDG, the one that, you know, I told you the, the standard, the, which is the um, fluorine, the, the actual glucose, um, uh, pet uh, agent. Um, and then if, again, the patients are not reduced with the pet, F, uh, uh, pet uh, then, you know, like those patients, although when they first identify as low risk, they become the high risk patients. As you can see, their survival actually <clears throat> reduces by 40% or by 30%. <clears throat> So this is actually huge. So, you know, like the, if somehow we can identify these patients, in this case, you know, like genetic profiling is not enough, you can identify them by uh, FDG and then it becomes the 
low risk, uh, uh, you know, like you can actually identify these patients and then intensify the treatment, basically give them more treatment. So similarly, the green and then orange, if you add them. So these are the uh, originally when they came by the genetic profiling, we profile them as low risk, I mean, the high risk group, right? Uh, however, even the in the uh, high risk group, you can find out that actually there's a higher risk group. Those are the ones that, you know, like the, the FDG are still, FDG imaging still shows uh, uh, the disease uh, after the chemotherapy, right? So <clears throat> the, again, the idea is this orange group right here is this, this is the highest risk group. And then it can be only identified, you know, by the FDG. So the idea then, you know, like the, again, you know, like the, for this one, um, uh, stratify these patients and then find the high risk patients and then add more targeted radiation to those patients. Because, you know, like generally speaking, the chemotherapy is, you know, uh, they use to highest chemotherapy they can use on these patients. Since it's a systemic therapy, then, you know, like you cannot really increase, otherwise the toxicity is going to prohibit the treatment. So what do you do in that case, right? So in that case, what we do is add total merit irradiation, which is a, has been demonstrated that, or we demonstrated that it's not toxic uh, because it's very targeted. <clears throat> so this is actually um, maybe a good uh, stop point. So, you know, like the, this is also, you know, like the a second clinical trial that we are running uh, by profiling the, um, the genetic uh, and then the using the FDG to identify the patients so that, you know, like we can uh, intensify the treatment. <laughs> so um, this is actually a good uh, stopping point. And then if anyone has questions, please write into um, uh, to the chat and then we'll hopefully uh, try to answer those. Um, okay. Okay, in the interest of time, I think, you know, like the, um, we can go to the next topic. And then the next topic is um, oxygen-guided radiotherapy. So um, the title of this talk is Turning an Enemy to an Ally, and then for a reason. So I'm, um, again, you know, like, I'm sorry, I don't know my audience. So, you know, like the this uh, talk is um, assuming that you have some radiation <clears throat> Um, uh, radiation therapy or the um, uh, uh, the cancer therapy, you know, background, right? Um, so uh, some of the things could be um, not easy to understand, but, you know, like the, uh, try to um, ask your questions. Hopefully I'll try to answer to uh, clarify. So, so there's a question, what are the genetic uh, targeting? So we are not targeting genetically. So there is a, actually a test that they do um, in their running the gen, uh, their uh, genetic profiling, and then those are standards, right? So basically, uh, we are not targeting the genes. So what we do is we find that we take the patients that the uh, genetic profiling already decided, or the doctors decided that this patient is a high risk patient, right? So by genetic profiling, and then that genetic profiling, um, it's standard. You know, like most of the places they do the same genetic profiling to identify high risk patients. Uh, yes, you can definitely uh, modify hypoxia response pathway genes to it, uh, and then people are doing it. So that is not my expertise, right? So I am actually more into finding out where the hypoxia is. And then, so uh, let me get to, and then you'll understand what exactly we're doing. There are other groups that they're trying to do. So successfully, I have not seen any successful, um, you know, like the uh, yet, but you know, like the, yes, that's definitely a way to do it. Okay. So um, hypoxia is actually very important. Hypoxia is adored in the lab and largely ignored in the clinic. So the reason that I'm, you know, saying that it's ignored because that's not, we do not have a very proven way of deal with the hypoxia. So let me give you a little bit of background with, uh, about the hypoxia first. 
So um, the hypoxia is very important and it has been around for almost a century. And then we know that the patients, you know, like the with hypoxia has less chance of uh, uh, responding to therapy, okay? And then as such, you know, like the, the major radiation oncology papers, there's like four top papers. And then in that four top ranked papers, if you look at it, three out of the four most, most cited papers are dealing with the hypoxia. And out of the 40 most cited papers, almost 50 of them, you know, like the, to be exact, 43% of them are related to hypoxia and radiation resistance, okay? So um, again, you know, like the, most of them are these, are lab works, like in animals, you know, like the um, many uh, hypoxia targeting genes, you know, like the drugs and everything work, but, you know, like many of them did not work in uh, humans, right? So still we are struggling, we are scratching our head, how we are going to be dealing with that hypoxia. So, um, so uh, the one of the thing is, uh, we are finding out that you know like and then this is actually a uh, table that shows the that uh, pathways right so you know like the if one alpha is one of them for instance right um so that's uh more or less that you know like the you can just basically there are lots of labs actually working on this you know trying to modify one of these things to handle the uh, hypoxia so um beyond that i think you know like the what we need to understand is we actually find out recently that the hypoxic tumors are more aggressive and then uh, tumor type and phenotype. And um, also that it actually um, induce uh, spontaneous metastases. And then in that case, you know, like the acute hypoxia, it seems like it's more relevant so, you know, like the two um, aggressive phenotype right now. So, you know, like people are actually still, we are uh, surf scratching the surface of the hypoxia after a hundred years. And uh, our attempts is basically more simplistic and then what we can do easily in the clinic today. Um, so this is actually a shocking table. And it's, uh, I'm just gonna give you uh, as, uh, you know, the other thing is most tum solid tumors are hypoxic. And then the survival rate, if a patient has a uh, hypoxic tumors, it's almost a death sentence compared to, you know, those patients who then have a hypoxic. And then if you look at it, you know, throughout the head and neck, lung, breast, pancreatic, cervix, prostate, you know, like the uh, sarcoma, brain tumors, they're all hypoxic. And then they're actually, you know, hypoxic re uh, ratio is very high. In the head and neck, 70%, breast, 60%, cervix, 50%, or the press 63%, pancreatic, all pancreatic cancers are uh, hypoxic. That's why they're just not responding, right? That's one of the most deadly tumors. One is staging, right? You know, we, by the time we catch them is very late. And then uh, cervix is almost 50% and prostate is around 20%, right? So, and then look at the brain tumors, like 65% almost. And then look at the, their um, uh, survival, right? So this is cervical cancer, for instance the six-year overall survival decreased from almost 90% to 30% if a patient has a hypoxic tumor, right? And then again, for the lung patients as well, almost 80% to 17% two-year overall survival. So, you know, like the, um, hopefully dealing with that, you know, we might be able to really help uh, quite a bit of patients as such Thus, the title of this talk is Turning an Enemy to an Ally. So um, we actually um, find out recently that the hypo hypoxia, we always thought that, you know, like the hypoxic resistance is mainly to radiotherapy, but we are finding out that hypoxia is also a res uh, driver uh, resistance to the immunotherapy and then also the uh, chemotherapy. So um, the combating hypoxia can be done in several ways, right? One is, you know, like the radiation boosting. So, you know, like the, if there is a hypoxic regions, we know that it doesn't, the resistance to therapy 
So if we know where about of uh, the hypoxia, then we can go and then boost them, right? So, you know, like this is actually demonstrates that as you can see, this is the, on a scale of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, the oxygen pressure. So if you can pre measure the absolute values of the oxygen within the tumor, and then less than 10, which is the blue here is uh, known as the hypoxic regions, then, you know, you can actually deliver more dose where the hypoxic regions are, right? The other methods is radio sensitization or, you know, like the, this is basically the way that, you know, like you um, manipulate and modify the, um, the hypoxia inducing genes. Uh, uh, and there, uh, these are the radio pharmaceutical on drugs and then hypoxia activated uh, prodrugs there exist. Uh, but again, you know, like these until today, they are not really as successful. So the other method is the easy, easier method is oxygen enhancing interventions, which is a breathing oxygen rich air, right? So, you know, patients, if they breathe oxygen rich air, whether their tumor is increased, you know, like the tumor oxygen is increased and then when it's increased. So <clears throat> there are some studies actually, you know, like that they have done as well. So, you know, I'm just gonna show you a couple of things what we are doing in our lab. The first one is the radiation boosting. So, um, uh, this is not our work, but, you know, like the basically um, in the clinic, right, radiation boosting uh, has not shown any actually um, uh, favorable results yet. So this is the early study, phase one study, and then they did the phase two study. In the phase one study, they concluded the median or overall survival seemed to be in favor of patients who received the radiotherapy boost. So, you know, like, I mean, um, as you can, I mean, this is one thing that, you know, like the, you want to criticize about this paper is, right, it's easy that, you know, like the, in a scientific language, we, there is no room, you know, like for these kind of vague statements, right? This cannot be a conclusion. The median overall uh, survival seem to be in favor of patients, right? So what kind of, you know, scientific uh, conclusion is this and then you can understand that you know like the uh, the um actually the uh their p value is 0 0.7 so you know like the, it's just a very very vague result very vague uh, conclusions and then based on this actually you know like the, they went to the phase two study and then phase two study sure enough they sh showed no actually improvement by um, increasing the dose to the hypoxic regions right so um, in the only paper that I know, only clinical work that I know to date, right? And then this is recently 2023 paper. Before this, I have not. I look at the literature and then we have a review paper actually. And then we couldn't find any, you know, like the paper uh, or the clin clinical uh, work shows any benefit until then, until this one. So what they did is actually identify patients in the head and neck with the um, hypoxic regions. And then they increased the dose from 70 gray to the 77 gray. And then one thing that I know, right, only seven gray should not really do much. And then all the other studies, actually, it has demonstrated that, you know, like increasing the dose to the hypoxic region, 10% is not going to do much, you know. And then from animal data, what we know is, you know, like you maybe need to increase this in some tumor types by 50%. And then that is generally toxic and then you cannot do that, okay? So, but in this paper, you know, they have demonstrated some benefit. So um, I was still, again, you know, like there's only one paper that I can find out that hypoxia boosting is helping. And then as such, I'm going to be concluding that by based on our review that in clinic, hypoxia boosting is not working. <clears throat> and then the reason for that, the dose may not be high enough. This may be associated with internal disadvantages of PET imaging because of the low resolution. You don't exactly know where the hypoxia is. And then hypoxia is, uh, the PET is not the surrogate for, I mean, measures only the surrogate. It does not measure really the oxygen level in the tumor. So what you measure in the surrogate, it might be different. As a matter of fact, a colleague of mine has actually a, a NIH grant looking at the f miso, you know, like and comparing with the uh, EPR, which is the electroparamagnetic paramagnetic resonance imaging. And um, he found out that actually the PET f miso imaging is not as accurate 
So, you know, like the, and then now they're developing a correction factor so that, you know, like you can use a gold method, which is not in the human studies yet because of the inherent uh, limitations, hardware limitations, but you can do in animals. So in animals, you can do both PET and then APR and then correct the PET F miso um, based on the, those uh, results. So <clears throat> there's also no universal definition of what is the hypoxia in or the, you know, what is the level of the hypoxia based on the PET imaging, right? So, and then we have seen that differences between the different centers, how actually they identify the contours based on the PET or the hypoxic contours. So that also is, you know, like the uh, founding, uh, co-founding effect. So um, with this, you know, like the, um, I will also say that it's not only clinical world, but also in the preclinical, in animals also, until, you know, we published and then I, we did our work, you know, there was no actually evidence that hypoxia boosting is helping uh, in the animals as well. So, you know, like because of that, many people, you know, says the um, hypoxia is adored in the uh, lab, but it's ignored in the clinic because we did not have any good evidences to show that, you know, like the delivering high doses to the hypoxic regions to beat the resistance to the therapy actually um, is not proven, right? So until actually we uh, did this study, and then in this study, actually in our first result was also very uh, uh, agreeing with the, uh, the uh, understanding that it does not work, right? So however, what we did is, you know, like we said, maybe, you know, like the, we are target is, targeting is not accurate. And then in animals, unfortunately, we use very crude models to radiate the animals because they're small, there's, you know, like, and then you have these cones that circular, try to, you know, like target it, it's not accurate. So we have these image guided, uh, cone beam CT guided, um, the uh, small animal irradiator, irradiator is, is a precision irradiator. And then, you know, like the, we actually develop a method where actually use the uh, shape, you know, 3D compensated, very small uh, uh, radiation uh, beam shaper so that we can accurately target the, uh, the tumor of the animals or the hypoxic regions within the tumor. So with that, actually we find out that this is actually showing you know how we did uh, the experiment and then sure enough if you look at our data that actually you know like improved quite a bit so the red one is for instance mch4 cell line in the tumor type in the uh, mice and you know when you do the experiment you know like the precise way then you can demonstrate that you know like the it's actually the um, overall so uh, the uh, the uh, the relapse rate right reduced from almost seventy percent to down to thirty to thirty five percent, and then similarly all other cell lines and then this is the blue for instance it's a sarcoma sarcoma in this case sixty percent to twenty five percent or thirty percent, um, so it works you know like however as you can see that you have to really do it right you have to know where the hypoxia is. And then, you know, like you have to really um, know how much dose you need to deliver to those uh, type of tumors. So the second one is radio sensitization. So in this case, you know, like the, the patients breathe uh, oxygen rich air, and then they went actually, you know, like a clinical trial with that, but it was basically uh, did not really result anything. The reason is basically, um, <clears throat> if you look at the clinical trial, uh, in retrospect, um, the reason that they did not show any benefit because they assume all patients responded to uh, oxygen-rich enhancing in, uh, interventions because they did not have any way to measure it, okay? So this is our actually collaborators' work from Dartmouth. And then in Dartmouth, what they did actually uh, in uh, different type of tumors, they look at, you know, like the, using the gold method that I described, EPR, Actually, they look at which uh, uh, what is the percent of the patients actually you can increase uh, their tumor increase meaningfully that will increase improve the uh, overall survival or uh, outcome, and then they find out that only this group of patients right here, right, 
um, that will actually uh, benefit from the uh, uh, the oxygen range. And then that's around 53%, okay? So, you know, 50% of the patients are not going to benefit from this. But it's a very, and it, although it's a 50%, it's, it's a very good number, right? So if we just choose those patients that, you know, will respond to this kind of treatment or the intervention, and then find out what is the peak level of their tumor oxygen is, and then hit the tumor uh, with that, and then you should get a better result. However, the clinical trial did not do that, okay? And then this is our um, the hypothesis of the study that, you know, like basically they did not have any means to measure it properly, okay, uh, to actually be able to uh, show any kind of benefit. And what do they need to do this then? You know, like a new method of measuring the tumor hypoxia, okay? And then this uh, method of measurement should be reliable, absolute, accurate, repeatable, and fast, okay? And then we don't have this method right now. However, you know, like there is a candidate, which is the electrode part of magnetic resonance imaging, okay? <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are familiar with this method, but it just basically, um, instead of the proton, it just, uh, you know, like uses the electron spin, okay? And um, if you place a, a, a unpaired electron, okay, um, in between two poles, and then by the way, oxygen is a paramagnetic, okay? And then because, you know, like the, the, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our body, it has one less electron. And then, you know, like the, um, when you, uh, put our actually body in between two electrodes, okay, uh, magnetic electrodes, then, you know, like the, just like the lines of the spin electrons are uh, line up parallel in the low energy or anti-parallel in the high energy. And then if then, you know, like the, you can um, induce uh, or add, add another, uh, uh, the uh, magnetic field, which is a B1, unpaired electron actually at the low energy state absorbs the energy and then are excited to the higher state, okay? That's the Zeeman effect. And then as such, you know, like when they come back, what they do to their, uh, you know, like the natural level, they basically uh, radiate or they release that energy and then you catch that energy and then you can then, you know, basically by looking at the, uh, the, uh, the, the bandwidth and then you can actually decide how much of the you know like material is in that um, tissue or in that specimen so um this is the way that you know like the basic oxygen is being accurately measured today using the epr and however you know in our body molecular oxygen is not enough okay so um what they did is, okay, if this is not enough, then what we can do is add another paramagnetic material in the system. And then we can look at the shift based on the known amount of the oxygen probe that, you know, like we, uh, introduced into the system. So, you know, like the, at, um, as you can see, as the, you know, like the, the amount of the oxygen, the unpaired electron increase, then you just start getting actually a more relative like broadening effect. And if you change the concentration of this second paramagnetic, we call uh, EPR spin probe, then you can start actually seeing um, a uh, correlations as you increase the, you know, like the amount of the uh, paramagnetic uh, material in that. And then you can actually, I'm sorry, not the, uh, the paramagnetic material is kept constant. And then what happens is the amount of the oxygen changes, right? If you have a higher oxygen level, then the total electrons, you know, like the differential electrons uh, signals that you're catching actually correlates with the um, amount of the oxygen. And then the amount of the oxygen, you know, like the, and then bandwidth actually linearly correlated as such, you can actually measure it. And then uh, India Inc., the people that use um, for tattoo, for instance, is paramagnetic. And then you can actually, people are using that to measure the uh, oxygen level in the uh, skin cancer, for instance. Skin cancers are, majority of them are tox, uh, hypoxic. So um, in any ways, um, this is how actually it can be. So this is actually a, our magnet. So this is a human sized magnet that we uh, designed. Um, okay. And in this case, you know, like the, um, one of the problem is, uh, of the EPR imaging, uh, the clinical application currently is not possible because, you know, like we are using very low Tesla, like 100, 
we generally use milli, milli Tesla, 100 milli Tesla level uh, uh, strength. And then that compares to, you know, like regular human clinical uh, MRIs is 100, uh, you know, like the Tesla, right? So milli Tesla versus the Tesla. So signal is actually, um, is not big. As such, you know, like the, the depth of the penetration is a um, little bit difficult. And then the spin probe that, the, you know, like the, the paramagnetic material that, you know, like we can actually improve the uh, measurements uh, is FDA clearance is still waiting and it, it might take still a long time. And and then as such, you know, like even even if it happens, the, you can, we find out that we cannot give a uh, high amount of these uh, uh, paramagnetic spin probes into the body. So it just basically might not be um, very feasible. However, there might be different methods of that could be um, you know, used still, right, uh, to do these kinds of things. And then that's actually where, uh, until, until right now, the technology that I described, I have nothing to do with that. And a colleague of mine are actually doing this. But, you know, like when I find out that, you know, like they, they still cannot get into the clinical realm, then I just told off that, you know, like maybe we should be able to do something different. So what we did is actually um, uh, make this clinical possible. Instead of imaging, we are creating some ways of, you know, like the multiple point measurements. If you do uh, quite a bit amount enough, then you can just sample the throughout the tumor, right? So that is the concept that we are developing. And uh, for that, you know, like we are developing, uh, you know, some technologies, implantable resonators, and then we are making, you know, like some technological developments that the patent pending. And then, you know, like the right now, you know, like the, our first application to do in the site uh, cervical cancer, you know, like the, although we were going to do around 30 points, you know, compared to people are not being doing anything, it was still good. But the people in the NIH, although the um, uh, they find that this is uh, invasive and limited uh, sampling size. So, um, and then we agree and then disagree with that. But then, you know, like we find out that if that's the case, then we can just do something different. And then uh, that different thing is actually, uh, we are <clears throat> piggybacking onto something that really um, currently invasive, okay? So that invasive thing is the HDR. So yeah, we treat patients, prostate, cervix, uh, head and neck, and then it's very effective treatment. you know. And then we put lots of needles in the patients, sometimes over 20, 25, okay? And then, you know, like what we are trying to do right now, convert these needles into oxygen permeable probes so that we can actually, you know, measure the oxygen through these needles right? These needles is put already in the patient to treat the patients. But what we're going to do is make these, you know, like the such that we can actually uh, put this patent pending resonators inside these needles so that we can actually, you know, like measure the uh, oxygen level before the treatment, okay? So we did some um, simulations, you know, like, and then our simulations gives really good um you know, like the signal to nose ratio, 205. So, you know, like in the current, just to give you an idea, um, you know, this is patent pending technology, but, you know, like the previous, uh, you know, like the uh, methods, they had a SNR of three, right? It's three versus 205. Do you remember I told you that, you know, like the, the signals is not uh, big enough or the large enough for us to be able to catch. So, you know, like we actually develop a, a novel technique to be able to do that you know, like the, with the SNR increase of 205. And then you generally need uh, an SNR of 100 to get a good signal. But if you want to resolve more than, you know, like the, let's say in this case, 100 points, then, you know, like you're going to be needing much more SNR, okay? And then uh, with these needles, we think that, you know, like we can measure 150 points within the tumor without adding any invasiveness. As such, you know, like the, we think that, you know, like we have a really good model right now. Um, so the whole idea is right now that, you know, like we can actually now develop clinic ready tools to enab enable repeated measurements of oxygen in patients without disturbing the clinical flow, identify patients who are oxygen levels are responsive to interventions to increase oxygen level, and then we can monitor hypoxia over the course of therapy. So this is actually a breakthrough, 
right? So although we know the hypoxia in the patients for over 100 years, right, no one knows at the details that we are going to be providing what happens to the hypoxia fast enough. So just to compare, give you an idea, a PET imaging with the F-MISO, right, with the, uh, it, it takes actually a couple of uh, hours at least, right? And then after that, you know, like the interpreting the results and everything, you know, takes another couple of hours. So you're looking at like three, four hours of, uh, you know, like the uh, time frame to be able to know what's happening with the hypoxia. And then by then, based on the most of the studies shows that hypoxia, especially the acute hypoxia changed already, right? So with this method, you know, like we, uh, could, can actually measure one point uh, less than a millisecond, right? Or, up, you know, less, less say, second. So if you're measuring 100 points, you're measuring around 100 seconds, okay? Or, you know, 200 points, you just like, in three minutes, basically, you can measure like uh, the, the 200 points within the tumor. Okay. So this is the teragnostic nanoparticles for cancer. We have another... Uh, seven minutes, hopefully we'll uh, get this thing done. So um, this is actually, um, I don't know how many of you guys watch this uh, Fantastic Voyage, but Fantastic Voyage uh, movie is an, actually um, one of the <clears throat> earliest science, science fiction that they told of about miniaturizing the our <laughs> medical, um, you know, like devices. In this case, you know, like the a, a medical um, ship so, you know, they have every everything inside, you know, like to, that diagnose and then treat patients, including the doctors and then, you know, like the professionals, nurses and everyone, right? So, you know, they miniaturize this whole ship and then, you know, put in the bloodstream and then the movie um, deals with or they, you know, like they shows that <laughs> their adventures finding the tumor, basically diagnostic right, approach or you're finding the disease, then, you know, like the right there and there fixing it within the body. <laughs> Excuse me. So this is a very similar idea. Now we have these na teragnostic nanoparticles. These particles can find the tumor, okay, and then also, you know, like treat them. Um, so we started this work like uh, back in 2010, um, I mean, 2008, 2009. What we did is uh, actually- Excuse me, uh, yeah. I, I'm sorry, Dr. Valand. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you, sir. I just, I would like to remind you that we just have five minutes left. Yeah. After that, we'll take question answers for the session, please. Okay. So Thank sure. you. Um, let me let me quickly finish this. So, you know, like we started this with the, you know, like the attaching the uh, deoxyglucose into the nanoparticles instead of the uh, fluorine. So the, our idea is, you know, PET machines are very expensive. Not, you know, every, you need the cyclotron, you need the radioisotopes. So you can do the CT, you know, like the same thing. Why not attach the oxyglucose to the nanoparticles? So we got a patent on this. And then we have demonstrated that actually this is possible. So throughout the time, you know, like the, we, it's, uh, you know, like the couple of companies approached us to actually um, maybe look at the commercialization path, but it was very difficult, right? So commercialization path for nanoparticles is very difficult, needs lots of money, okay? So we quickly then, you know, like find out that, you know, like this is not the way, then, you know, like we start looking at the different methods. And then, so one of them is actually, you know, like looking at the PSMA, uh, gadolinium nanoparticles. So this is what we are doing currently. And then we have demonstrated that actually we can, uh, as you can see, you know, like the this and then this, it shows the PET or the PSMA uh, plus or PSMA minus tumor. So PSMA plus meaning that, you know, like the if, if PSMA affinity is high, then, you know, they can really uh, target these and then nanoparticles can get there. And then you can actually see that you know, the difference, the accumulations of the PSMA. And then you can get a uh, CT, you can get a uh, MR, and then you can see these tumors. And then uh, if you look at the uh, the tumor growth, you know, with our nanoparticles, tumor growth actually, you know, like they reduces by five folds, you know, like the compared to without the nanoparticles. So now, you know, like we are developing these Monte Carlo methods that, you know, we can uh, try in the animals, so that, you know, like we can target them, you know, like the, uh, very carefully as, as I discussed, you know, targeting is important. So, you know, like this is the 3D printed, you know, like IMRT uh, 
you know, compensators, that's how we are treating them. So, you know, like the, uh, I have a large group of collaborators, collaborators, and then the group in my lab. And without them, this cannot be possible. So let's look at the questions right now. And then, um, so where are the questions? Come on. Okay. Sir, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Balan, for your wonderful presentation. Um, I will I will take the questions, yeah. sir. I will sure. read them out for you. Um, and I will pick the ones that are most relevant and the ones that you haven't already covered in your presentation to save time. Sure. Okay, so still we have an interesting question here. Uh, Somebody is asking, um, how how processed foods cause cancer? Uh okay. I'm not gonna get into that. It's I'm, I'm not. It's not my topic. I'm sorry. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Me meaning that I know, but this is not related to this presentation. So. Right. Right. sir. okay. So. Um, uh, somebody's asking, is there any role of polymorphism or SNPs in hypoxia pathway genes in treatment response? Or there is any study representing role of single nucleotide polymorphism or genetic polymorphism of mentioned genes? Oh, okay. So that's, again, you know, like the I, it's not my, you know, like area of the studies. So I'm not going to be able to answer that question either. So. Hello. Right, sir. Yes, right, sir. Let me let me check if they have any relevant questions to this presentation. Yeah. I mean, that's not my expertise. The genes, you know, like the modifying the pathways, you know, like the. I'm a radiation physicist, right? So I'm a physics background guy. You know, like my uh, strength is developing technologies. You know, like the developing targetings. You know, like the. So those kind of stuff. So, you know, like those questions are more relevant to someone who's really studying the pathways and then the molecular pathways and, you know, like most likely radiobiologist. So. Right. So, and uh, somebody's asking, what are the common symptoms and potential long-term effects of hypoxia on the human body? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> there is no symptoms of, you know, like the uh, hypoxia in the body, Right. And then the hypoxia uh, generally uh, happens on the tumors. If you have a tumor, then, you know, like the, if it's a hypoxic tumor, then, you know, like the, the overall survival of those patients are shorter than the patients with no hypo uh, hypoxia, right? So that's the only uh, place that I know in the cancer world that, you know, like, the, but other than that, you know, like the, uh, our body is not hypoxic. We have enough uh, oxygen in our body, right? Or you know, if you don't have an, enough oxygen, it it might have different uh, effects on our body. But you know, like again, uh, for cancer, I can answer that question, right? For cancer, uh, it's detrimental. Basically, it's a death sentence. You know, like if somebody has a uh, hypoxic uh, tumors. Right, sir. And there's uh, someone else who's asking, can we modify hypoxia response pathway genes to avoid hypoxia during treatment? Yes, I answered that question actually already. So yes, that is possible. So there is quite a bit of uh, radio pharmaceutical companies. They are doing research and then labs on that, you know, and then there are some drugs that, you know, like has been, you know, like they tried. But uh, until today, I don't know if anyone has actually really demonstrated a clinical benefit. But, you know, there are it's some very active areas of the study. Yes. And it can be done. Right. OK, sir, somebody is asking um, how cancer cells survive without oxygen. OK, that's a good question. So um, that's that's basically what happens, right? So you know, like the <clears throat> uh, in the in the tumor, uh, we have these necrotic uh, areas where actually you know, like there's not enough oxygen. Okay, there's still some oxygen, and then these tumor cells actually do not do anything but proliferating, right? So you know, like the they actually. Um, do not need enough, you know, like the like other cells, like a functioning cells need lots of energies and then lots of, you know, like the um, 
loss, loss of oxygen to basically be able to uh, f do all their functions. So when actually you don't have enough oxygen, what happens to these tumors? They start dying and then they just basically create these necrotic areas with the dead you know, like the uh, tumor cells, okay? And then that's why, you know, like your tumor, actually what happens is as they grow, the necrotic cells actually becomes inactive, you know, like the dead cells and uh, the the surrounding areas, you know, like start actively growing. And then you have these big mass of, you know, like tumor, okay? And part of it is actually dead. Okay, part, of, but you know, there's active sites that you know, like they keep proliferating and getting bigger. As such, you know, like what happens is through time, if you don't treat, right, it's just gonna, if say, let's say that's a liver cancer, so the whole liver becomes, you know, like non functioning uh, dead cells plus actively uh, dividing cells, like if, uh, the, uh, the cancer cells. So, right, thank you very much, sir. I think we can take two more questions. Um, so somebody's asking, is there a role for varying size quantum dots in therapy? What's the question again? Is there a role for varying size quantum dots in therapy? Varying size? What size? Varying. Size. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, like the... um. People are doing some work on that one, but again, you know, like the, it's not my area of the work. So, you know, there's some interesting, really, really interesting works in that. Yeah, that's another area, the active area that, you know, like I would suggest who has a, you know, interest, you know, look, look into it. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So, and somebody's asking how much of this research is, ap is applicable in, in clinics? Uh, I, I think I just answered that question. I just basically throughout, you know, like my studies, you know, like the I basically pointed out where we are in the clinical application and then what's needed uh, to get this into the clinic, right? And uh, so, for instance, you know, like this oxygen um, uh, in the in, in, in the oxygen presentation. So the, currently uh, what we need is very accurate imaging, right? And then EPR is a very you know, like APR is the gold method, right? However, it's not going to get into the clinic maybe another 10, 15 years, most likely. And then until we find out, you know, like the a way to measure this better or the image it better without, with less, you know, paramagnetic uh, materials, okay? So we have to inject these to the patients and then now FDA is not clearing, okay? <clears throat> so what is the pathways then? I mean, we got to do something, okay? So that is the pathway that I showed you. That is my actually uh, research. You know, like first we invented actually, you know, like we can measure in a couple of points and then, but it was invasive, right? But it was in a couple of points, but still it will give you some ideas, you know, like what's happening within the tumor, okay? Very fast. So the whole idea is also, it has to be very fast. Okay, we cannot wait like a couple of hours uh, to get the F-MISO and then it's also surrogate. So in this case, we created this, you know, invented this, you know, like the resonators to measure in more than so many points. Okay, and then, you know, like the, when we find out that, you know, like that's invasive, we, can, we might not be able to put every tumor enough. Then we actually right now piggybacking on the HDR needles so that you know like we are going to be these needles are already in the patient right so you know we're going to use those we are converting those things to be oxygen permeable needles right now that's the, my company is actually really undertaking that research right now and uh so hopefully you know like once we have these needles uh we can actually start doing in the hdr world and then if the hdr world shows that this actually um works then you know like we can extend into other uh treatment sites like prostate head and neck and then if that works then you know like the i'm sure that you know we'll find a method that simplify the treatment you know like the so i envision actually in one day especially in developing countries that you cannot just buy lots of linear accelerators I, i'm sure that in pakistan right now there's not enough linear accelerators right and um, so, however, the HDR machines are cheap, you know, like more accessible. Uh, it's just basically we have clinical expertise in uh, in our countries. 
so that, you know, like we can actually do more HDR and then more effective radiotherapy by actually uh, using the HDR. And then with, so with these uh, oxygen permeable needles, you can measure where the oxygen um, hypoxia, is, re, uh, hypoxia is and then deliver more doses into that area or have the patients breathe oxygen air and then choose those patients that responds to that treatment. And then, you know, like the for the other ones, you just basically give more uh, therapy. So there is a, so many clinical pathways that you can actually get these things into the clinic. And then that's what we are working. That's what our uh, grant is. Right. So, um, and we can take one last question. Um, so somebody is asking, how is radiation standardized for one's body? Radiation standardized by stage of the patients, generally, right? So if the patient comes, has a stage of this disease, then, you know, like they get this much dose. So that is basically generally um, has been done by trial and error. And then also, you know, like the by the uh, threshold of the 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 clinical uh, critical organs around the tumors. OK, so, you know, like our doctors has a this tick book. And then, you know, generally, you know, like they uh, they have different stages and then how much dose they need, you know, like what needs to be done. So generally, you know, like all the patients got that kind of dose by their staging. So, you know, like it's a very standard. And then those actually also has some, you know, like the um, associated cure rate, associated survival rates, and then associated, you know, toxicity levels. So, you know, like throughout these, you know, like the hundreds of years, years that, you know, we are treating treat, uh, patients, we accumulated enough information to know for which stage the you know, patients that we have to give those and then what kind of expectations or prognosis with that kind of dose, you know, like the we can expect. And that's what we are using. It's not like, again, you know, like for instance, we are not really really using uh, any biological information when we decide, right? So, you know, like personalization comes from there. So, you know, for instance, although you, <clears throat> so here's a good example for you to understand. Two patients come with the stage three, let's say, lung cancer, okay? So <clears throat> they will get the same dose, okay? They will get the same dose if their critical organs is, um, you know, like the, is not, is on the way. Let's say one patient has, let's say, let's assume that that two patients has this tumor in the same areas or the lobe in the, uh, in the, uh, in the lung, away from the critical organs, right? We are going to deliver the same exact dose to those patients without knowing their, you know, like the much about their hypoxia level in their tumors. And then I showed already in that table that if the patient has a hypoxia and two-year overall survival of that patient Um, sorry, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. So uh, those patients are going to get the same uh, dose because we don't know how aggressive, how hypoxic tumor one has. But if we know, then we can actually alter the treatment and give hopefully more dose or we do something else for those patients. Okay, that's how actually we uh, standardize the um, dose based on our previous experiences. And then or every patient get that dose with the, that stage. And then what I'm proposing here, and then what everyone wants to do, hopefully understand which patient has a radio resistant tumor based on different biological parameters, okay? And then do something else for those patients.
Thank you very much, Dr. Bulenth. We have <clears throat> several more questions, but uh, due, due to shortage of time, we will be unable to take them, unfortunately. Yeah. But I would like to express my gratitude, sir. Thank you very much for sparing your time for us yeah. and for your wonderful and very insightful presentation. We can see lots and lots of praises and um, good remarks for your presentation. Thank you very much, sir. And I would also like to thank the participants for joining us for, for today's session. And uh, we hope to see you for future important events as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.